Okay. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming in so early. So we are just going to wait a few more minutes to let more people come in. I can see a lot more people uh, joining us as the seconds go by. So. Um, while we wait, we just have a few questions that you guys can answer. So we're going to start with a few polls. You might see something coming up on your screen now. Okay, great. So we have a large number of responses in already. And uh, this is a great start to this panel discussion on sharks. So welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. And uh, I especially want to thank the panelists that we have today because they really have uh, crazy schedules and to take this much time I know is a lot for them. Uh, and to thank the team at Ashoka University and uh, at In Season Fish for helping to organize this. So thanks everyone. Uh, today we are here to discuss uh, something that goes beyond just one country. So we want to talk about sharks and rays in this entire region, which I think is uh, relatively less represented uh, in a lot of discussions about shark and ray conservation. So uh, without uh, wasting more time, I just want to start introducing, um, yeah, I want to start introducing sharks and rays and all these types of species to people who, have, uh, who are hearing about them for the first time. Uh, and then we'll move on to why we are doing, uh, why we have this panel in the first place. Okay. So sharks are animals that typically look like this. Uh, unfortunately, I have very rarely ever seen them like this. I typically see them dead. Uh, but there are a whole diversity of sharks 
in our waters around uh, south asia and this diversity is captured by the fact that uh, not all sharks look like this there are many different types uh, as you said in the poll not all sharks are carnivorous we've recently discovered one in the world that is a vegetarian uh, and we have the world's largest fish like the one that you see on the bottom left which is the whale shark uh the one on top which is the blue shark and the one on the bottom right which is the bull shark so these are some of the types of sharks that you may encounter uh anywhere in these waters but beyond sharks there are other species that uh, are very close relatives which are the rays so when most people think of rays they think of these large manta rays but we have a whole bunch of other species that also uh form part of these groups and these include things like the eagle ray which is on the top left the cow nose ray which is on the top right some whip tail ray which is uh, on the bottom and many many more so we have a huge number of species and a huge diversity in this region but today beyond just sharks and rays we will also be talking about other species and these include the wedge fish and guitar fish which uh, seem to be sort of a cross between a shark and a ray because they are flattened but at the same time they still have the dorsal fins uh, and they live near the bottom of the ocean and these are species that uh, were so neglected that for the Lydia, longest time again. sorry your slides aren't moving for anyone okay now is it visible let me try this again okay is this visible now yes okay yeah so these are all the rays that i was talking about and then i moved on to guitar fish which i hope you can see here a wedge fish which i hope you can see here um which is what i said was a cross between a shark and a ray okay i will do that again i only have one more slide so sorry this is the wedge fish i hope you can see this now this wedge fish seems to be a problem <laughs> and finally i'm going to quickly end this off with the sawfish which is a um, species that used to be quite ubiquitous in our waters around this area particularly in shallow coastal regions but unfortunately now we see them very very rarely so rarely that it makes news every time we see one uh but the reason that we're talking about the conservation of these species is because even though they are fish they are quite different from other fish they have a uh, uh, typically much longer life spans which means they are much slower growing and they have very few young compared to Uh, other bony fishes which may lay thousands of eggs uh, many of sharks and rays actually give birth to live young and as a result can't have thousands of them sitting within uh, them to be able to give birth so because of these characters they are quite vulnerable to many types of environmental problems including uh, excessive fishing uh pollution and various other issues so even though we are talking about a fishery which consists of many different species 
the sharks and rays and guitar fishes and sawfish, of course, uh, are particularly threatened and they are particularly vulnerable. And this is the reason that we want to talk about conserving sharks and rays in this area and in this region. So to have this discussion today, we have with us some of the biggest experts on sharks, rays, and all these elasmobranchs from this region. We have Shanta Shamsunahar, who is from WCS Bangladesh, and who has been working on uh, sh the conservation of sharks and rays for the last uh, three and a half years at least. And her work primarily takes her uh, to interact with fishermen and to uh, identify ways in which people can conserve uh, these species in Bangladesh's waters. Then we have Reema Jabado, who is a founder of the Elasmo project and who has been the re regional vice chair of uh, the IUCN shark specialist group for the Indian Ocean region. Uh, and her work has taken her, uh, I think, pretty much across South Asia and also West Africa. And she has extensive experience uh, both on conservation as well as on uh, sharks and rays in this region. And we also have Daniel Fernando, who has, uh, is the co-founder of Blue Resources Trust and will be talking about the Elasmo Brank project in Sri Lanka. He is most famous, I think, for putting mobulids on the map in terms of conservation and especially for his policy work at CITES and other international uh, organizations. So without further ado, I now uh, will stop talking and give the opportunity for you guys to listen to what's happening with sharks and rays in the northwestern part of the Indian Ocean. Uh, and this will be presented by Reema Jabari. Thank you, Divya. Can everyone see my slide? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all doing well and you're staying safe during these difficult times. Um, I'd like to first thank Divya for, and the team at In Season Fish and Ashoka University for organizing this virtual panel discussion. And I'm going to be talking to you specifically about sharks of the Northwestern Indian Ocean, their known status and conservation needs. I will use the term shark, but please keep in mind that I am referring to both shark and rays, which is a very large and diverse uh, group of species. So um, like Divya said, they are basically, they form a group called the elasmobranchs, they're fish. And around the world, there are over 1,200 species of sharks. And of these, about 530 species of what we really know as sharks, and then 654 species of rays. And they come in all shapes and sizes, and they utilize, they have different behaviors, and they utilize various marine habitats uh, from freshwater, estuaries, coastal areas, or even the high seas. And over the past 20 years, we've really increased the number of shark species that we know of, partly because of an increasing focus, uh, research focus uh, on, in the field of taxonomy, where we now not only rely on morphometrics of so what a shark looks like, but also we take into account species delineations based on genetics. And one thing that's really important to know is, again, as, as Divya mentioned, while they're fish, they're a different kind of fish in the sense that they have lifespans that are a lot longer than regular fish. So with a, a normal fish would live maybe a maximum of 30 years. Sharks can live up to 300 years. Fish mature very early. They can reproduce multiple times a year and can have a gestation period of just a few days. But for sharks, they're often late to mature. So sometimes only after they've been alive for 20 years or longer, they sometimes reproduce once a year and they and giving birth to one pup and sometimes with gestation periods of over two years. So even their reproductive system is a lot more conservative than humans. And these differences are really important because when shark populations are overexploited, it can take them decades to actually recover, if at all, even after strict protection measures have been put in place. And 
To add to this, as sharks live in deeper water, so deep sea sharks, those that only occur at 200 meter depth and below, have even more conservative life history traits. So they're slower to grow, they mature at a later age, they have higher longevity and even smaller litters. And in this Northwest Indian Ocean region, we know that we have almost 160 species of sharks that are confirmed. And if you look at the maps that I have here, so you've got the first map that shows the sharks on them, 77 species, and the next map that shows the rays on them. And the deeper the color on the map, so the deep red are the areas where we have the highest diversity of sharks that we know of. And as you can see, as we move along the coast of Pakistan, India, and Sri Lanka, there are, there's a very high species richness. And these are areas with very, very high diversity of species. And they're areas that also overlap with a lot of uh, fisheries. And just in India, if we were to include the Bay of Bengal, where we haven't done this type of exercise yet, we know that there are over 120 species of sharks that occur in that one country. So very important area to conserve biodiversity, but also to try and protect these species and manage um, what's happening. And um, Divya asked for us to highlight what are some of the species that we think are, or that we are the most interested in. And I've put circles, the red circles here, around the, what we call the rhino rays. So this is a group of sawfishes, butchfishes, and guitar fishes. And there is about 65 species of them in the world. And we recently looked at them in terms of extinction risk and conservation status. And we found that these 60 species are now considered the most threatened marine species in the world. So more threatened than whales, more threatened than dolphins, more threatened than turtles. And we're, we're seeing populations decline very, very quickly. And I want to go through why these populations uh, are declining and why we as scientists are actually concerned. In the 1990s, there are some shocking figures that come out, came out from the scientific community. Some species had seen their populations decline by over 90%. Another study that looked at warehouses and the number of fins in the warehouses in Hong Kong showed that up to 73 million sharks were likely being killed every year for the fin trade. We have assessments that show that a quarter of the world's shark and ray species are threatened with extinction. That means that they're considered critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable. That what's really driving this population decline is the international demand for their fins and for their meat. And that they're taken primarily as bycatch or are targeted in certain fisheries. And this is really important because uh, the problem is that sharks are collateral damage. They are mostly threatened by fisheries. They're caught in all types of gears from nets, so gill nets or trawlers to long lines in beach seines and some species even in small seemingly unharmful fishing traps. And they're caught in small scale fisheries, so artisanal fisheries, but also in industrial fisheries and recreational fisheries. And you might have heard uh, reports about how many of our oceans are already overfished and the growing issue of overcapacity where there are too many boats that are out fishing at the same time. And I just wanted to show you uh, some pictures that are taken at various sites by myself and some colleagues uh, where we've worked at in the region. And this happens every single day where thousands, hundreds of thousands of sharks are landed uh, at one site or at or different sites around the world. So imagine the scale of the exploitation and what's actually happening. And this map shows you some of the key countries that have reported large quantities of shark landings from 2007 to 2017. If you see here, the largest circle is Indonesia and it has ranked as the first fishery for sharks for a very long time, followed by India, which is the second largest fishery in the world, Spain and Taiwan. But if you look closer just at the Northwest Indian Ocean region, these waters are surrounded by some of the largest shark fisheries in the world. This means that even if we protect sharks in one country, because many sharks are migratory or they swim large distances and move across borders, they're likely to get caught in some gear. 
And as I mentioned, they're caught in various fisheries and the key driver was for a very long time, the value of their fins. And this illustration at the bottom here shows you some of the key fins that are, um, the, that are in demand. So you've got the dorsal fin, the two pectoral fins, so one on each side of the body and the lower part of the tail. And they are especially traded with uh, and in demand, especially in China and in Hong Kong. But it's really important to note that shark meat has also been traditionally consumed in many countries, including in India and in Sri Lanka and in Bangladesh. And the trade in shark meat is actually increasing around the world. So in the last decade, we've seen an increase of over 150% in the quantities of shark meat that's being traded around the world. And so, what is the status of sharks in this region? So I apologize, I don't include the Bay of Bengal here. That was not part of, the, of uh, this assessment that we did, but we looked at basically data on sharks and rays from 20 countries. So starting Maldives, Sri Lanka and going all the way around to Somalia. And we've basically looked, uh, scientists around the world have issued the warning to humanity saying that um, we have we live in a world where human activity has become the dominant influence on the environment. And they call uh, what we're leading to the sixth extinction event and that time is running out. And we've left our footprint on a lot of species. And from again, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature read list of threatened species, about 20% of species, known species that have been assessed are considered to be threatened with extinction. When we did an assessment, a global assessment for sharks in 2014, we saw that 25% uh, of sharks and rays were actually threatened with extinction. And we wanted to do the same exercise for this region and see what was happening. And as we quickly started collecting the information, one, some of the key things that came out was that 10% of the world's sharks and ray catches were coming from this region. And that this small area, actually four countries, the UAE, Yemen, Oman, and Pakistan, were actually exporting 11% of all the fins that were being uh, received in Asia. And this is not because they're necessarily fishing for them, but they're transport hubs and all of the fins are coming to these areas. And what our results show was that this, uh, this graph here is basically all of the species that we assessed, 153 species. And the three colors, the red, the orange, and the yellow show the threatened categories. Well, our region shows that over 50% of sharks and rays are considered threatened in this region. So compare this to the 25% globally. And this is as bad as the Mediterranean. We've done a regional assessment there. But this is the, the, the scariest part of the world because we're seeing population declines very, very quickly. And we still have issues with the sense in the sense that we don't have enough information on these sharks and rays. They remain understudied. The, we know that there's intense and unregulated fishing. We know that there's habitat loss and degradation. And we know that there is increasing fishing intensity and a lack of overall fisheries management or enforcement if management measures are actually occurring. So what can be done? Just very quickly, it's not all doom and gloom. There's some light at the end of the tunnel there. And we have examples from other parts of the world where we have seen that small actions can make a difference. Um, there are areas where they've set up marine protected areas or shark sanctuaries that have been very beneficial for, for reef populations, so shark and rays that utilize reef habitats. There have been a lot of campaigns, particularly in Asia, to try and reduce the demand for shark fins. And we have seen a change in behavior in many of the younger generation in particular that understand the concept of conservation. And there is increasing... Um, interest in dive tourism and it's bringing in millions of dollars to different countries and this is really pushing forward conservation. Um, other things that have been done are community driven conservation that has been key through outreach and capacity building. We've seen individuals from the poorest communities that have become ambassadors and that support the protection of species, that help with or even lead data collection projects and work to find alternative livelihood solutions. There are other larger things, um, instruments, let's say, partly from the United Nations. One of them is the Convention on Migratory Species, the Sharks Memorandum of Understanding, 
or the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. I won't go into the details of these, but they're basically a legal framework where countries that are parties to them have certain obligations. With uh, the Convention on Migratory Species, it might be the protection of certain species that are considered threatened. With CITES, so the international trade, it's about regulating the trade and issuing permits when uh, species are considered, uh, are listed on the, on the convention. And there are other regional um, fisheries bodies, like the one that governs the, the region here is called the IOTC, the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. And again, there are some species that are, uh, that should receive protection under some of the resolutions from this um, fisheries body. The key thing to take out of this, though, is that there are, if you remember, I said there are 1,200 species of sharks and there are potentially less than 50 species that are covered by any of these instruments. So still a lot to be done in terms of bringing attention to sharks and rays and putting them on the agenda for these. So um, what are some of the key things for the region um, in terms of directions and recommendations? Fisheries legislations need to, uh, to be updated to protect threatened species. Most species that have been protected in the region, um, the, the legislation has not been updated for decades sometimes, and it doesn't reflect the current threats to many of these species. More important than that is if we protect species, we need to enforce it. We need to make sure that fishing communities are engaged and that they are included in any enforcement and monitoring that takes place. We need better training and uh, capacity building initiatives. There are so many individuals in the region that are willing and are, would love to work on sharks and rays, but there's just not enough to be able to push them in that right direction and to provide them with the training that they need. Uh, we need to improve fisheries dependent data collection on both artisanal and commercial industrial fisheries, partly because without data, we cannot make the right decisions. We need this information to be able to inform policy. We still need a lot of information and just basic biological research on deep sea and many of the data deficient species that occur here. And we urgently need to address the issue of bycatch in various fisheries. And bycatch, for those of you who don't know, is when we put a net in to catch tuna, but we catch more sharks and rays than tuna. So this is a big problem. It's accidental catch, but it's occurring. And it is a big concern when it comes to sharks and rays. And I'm gonna leave it at that and I'm happy to take questions about this afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Rima. Um, yeah, so those of you who have questions, you can start typing them out in the chat box. Uh, but while you're doing that, also please keep your ears open for Daniel Fernando because he is now gonna take us to the central Northern part of the Indian Ocean around Sri Lanka, but also tell us about the larger picture with respect to sharks in international uh, policy arrangements and conventions and so on. So welcome, Daniel. Uh, Daniel, you, you will have to unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, hi, thanks so much. Uh... Fabian, thanks so much for organizing this uh, panel. I think it's incredibly valuable uh, to have these type of discussions in the region. Um, yeah, I hope you can see my slides. Yeah, okay, good. Right. So I'm going to talk a bit more from a uh, Sri Lankan perspective, so touching on what uh, Rima already spoke sharks and rays are facing globally, and I'm going to bring this a bit more from a Sri Lankan perspective, and then talk about some of the work that we have done to uh, overcome the challenges that we are facing and to try and basically reduce shark and ray mortality, because that's the issue that we have at the end of the day. It's too many sharks and rays that are uh, getting killed across the world. And this is happening largely due to, well, demand from, you know, people all across the world for seafood. 
what we are having are both industrial fisheries and artisanal fisheries that have constantly expanded probably since the 1950s to supply the demand for fish. As economies develop around the world, as uh, technology improves, we're able to store fish for long periods of time and give people who previously didn't have access to fish fresh seafood. For example, I grew up in Sri Lanka in the highlands and as a child, it was impossible to get fresh fish. At best, the best case scenario was some dried fish that one would have access to. But now we're in a situation where pretty much anywhere in the country and probably in the most remote, pa remote parts of the world, far from a coastline, it is possible to get fresh seafood. And it is this demand for seafood that is driving fisheries across the world to expand and quite often to start utilizing unsustainable fishing techniques. Because at the end of the day, we don't just want to consume seafood, we want to consume cheap seafood that is easily available. We want to go to any supermarket and buy a can of tuna off the shelf. And in order to get seafood at such large quantities, at such a low cost, fisheries have adapted and started using all sorts of techniques. So like Prima mentioned, uh, you know, gill nets or, you know, these large nets that are stretching across the oceans are quite common now. And they don't just catch the species that fishers are most interested in. So a lot of fishermen, especially in Sri Lanka, go out predominantly to focus on catching tuna. But what they end up doing is catching a lot of other species at the same time. Sharks and rays, but also other species like turtles and all sorts of, all sorts of cetaceans. And this bycatch in countries like Sri Lanka is not discarded at sea. So it is brought back to shore and something is done with it. As Rima mentioned, a lot of it is supplying international trade routes. For example, the sharks, uh, we have all heard about the shark fin trade. There are some species like the manta and mobulas where the gill plates fetch very high values. And other products like skin and cartilage also drive these fisheries. But one of the differences with a lot of other countries is that these species, they don't just cut the valuable parts of the species and discard the rest of the body at, at sea, they bring them and make use of the entire body. Uh, but what this has resulted in is also an increase for meat because as these species have been landed for their fins, the meat has started uh, getting more and more valuable uh, because they have marketed it a lot more. And this has also in turn now started contributing toward the shark and ray captures that we are seeing. And unfortunately, as Rima mentioned, with these species having such conservative life cycles, you know, any large scale industrial fisheries will have a negative impact on many of these species. Now in Sri Lanka, we have actually been running a survey since around 2017 to document these species. And what we have documented are over 17,000 specimens across the country at different landing sites. And we have identified 91 different species, so both sharks and rays. And there is significant diversity, which is positive, but the diversity is probably lower than what it used to be historically. Because when we look at old species checklists for Sri Lanka, there were much higher numbers. So for example, just of sharks, the checklists say that there were over 100 different species. Of course, this could be due to challenges uh, from a taxonomic perspective with the identification of, this, of these species. But it could also be an indicator to some extent that the species diversity is not as high as it used to be. But one of the other exciting things, uh, which is you know, positive to some extent, is that some of the preliminary research we conducted shows you know, through genetic studies and all that, that there are actually some new species out there which we didn't know about at all. So this is positive, but it also is something we need to be cautious about. Uh, you know, the fact that we don't even know that some species exist in our waters 
could mean that we are potentially wiping them out before they're even discovered. And for sharks and rays, as you can see from these images, you know, there is a lot of diversity, but there are lots of species that quite often look similar to each other. And this creates a lot of challenges when it comes to the identification of these species. And unfortunately, globally, there are not that many uh, projects out there that are focusing on these species, you know, due to multiple issues, funding probably being the largest issue. Uh, but, you know, organizations like ours in Sri Lanka are trying to gather as much data as we can. So we essentially have a whole bunch of marine biologists uh, situated around the country, many of them students working on their undergraduate or graduate thesis projects, collecting information. They basically go to landing sites across the country, uh, see what species are being landed, collect photographs to be able to visually identify them, collect tissue samples so that we can conduct uh, genetic studies, and then also do a lot of other investigations. Because ultimately, in order to try and manage fisheries, we need to know how many of a particular species are out there in the ocean, uh, how wide they are distributed, and as much biological information as we can. So we do studies to try and figure out the age of species, how quickly they grow, how many pups uh, they give birth to, and how often they reproduce because all of this information is necessary to conduct a thorough stock assessment of a species to be able to properly manage it and identify whether it's a species that can be captured or not, and if it can be captured to what extent. There are lots of gaps that we currently have, and I would say that probably one of the largest gaps is the lack of long-term data at a species level. So we have some information available at a global scale, uh, you know, with regard to how sharks are doing in general. And this is where we have seen these significant declines. But what we are often lacking is at a national level or at a regional level, long-term trends for particular species. And one of the largest constraints for this is of course the lack of funding because it's quite easy or relatively easy to get funding for an interesting project that lasts about six months to 12 months where you get a quick result. But when you try to get funding for a project where you say, okay, it will take us about 10 years before we get a good understanding of the species, that is a lot more difficult. But we have to do this because if we don't, these species will potentially or will go extinct in a lot of parts of the, in many parts of the world. Uh, we have seen local excavations of certain species like sawfish. This has been uh, an issue across many parts of the world and actually a publication that we'll be releasing, uh, that we'll be submitting shortly uh, will highlight that, you know, even in countries like Sri Lanka, sawfishes have faced extreme declines and if we don't work on the management of species like this, others that have similar slow reproductive cycles will probably face uh, similar situations. So what we do with all of the data that we gather is not just publish in scientific reports and all that, but try and make concrete changes that are uh, seen on the ground that actually result in a decrease in shark mortality. And we do this by working with uh, politicians, both at national, regional, and international levels. And, you know, Rima touched upon this. We work through uh, regional management organizations like the IOTC, the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, and through UN conventions uh, for which many countries are party to, like uh, the CITES Convention. But it's not easy. It takes many years to get governments uh, to recognize these species as requiring additional attention. And just because one gets a species listed on one of these conventions or management uh, organizations doesn't mean that the job is done. We have to then work closely with these governments to provide them with specific information that they need to be able to implement the management measures that they have committed to. So this 
comes in many forms, for example, developing identification guides for species, or for example, for the products that are being traded, like the shark fins across international borders. And, you know, in a manner of ways, collecting additional information, helping them with stock assessments. But all of this has to be realistic, has to be financially feasible, and it should be adaptable to change over time. Because these species, you know, their populations are decreasing, some might be increasing, and we have to adapt our management to suit those as we proceed. And what I would like to say that at the end is we all have a role to play. We all are responsible to some extent, because if we are consuming seafood, we have to make a, a decision to try and choose a sustainable uh, species, but not just a species that is sustainable, but one that is captured through a sustainable technique as well. And this can vary from country to country, region to region. And for this, we have to continue collecting a lot more data and working closely with governments to ensure that there is management in place. Because ultimately, I believe that we are looking largely at two scenarios. Either we keep fishing at the rate that we are and accept the fact that many species will go extinct. And as a result, fisher, fishers will lose livelihoods across the world. Or we take the very difficult decision to look at cutting back on fisheries, switching and transitioning to more sustainable techniques, reducing the number that we catch, but also focus on marketing more sustainable fish and not marketing threatened species. It's not a scenario that everybody will benefit out of. There will definitely be losses to livelihoods and all that. But unfortunately, these are the difficult decisions that have to be taken at this point in time, because we have come to such a stage where these species have declined so far that you know, we cannot just take simple decisions. We have to take very difficult decisions to ensure that both the species survive and the fisher livelihoods uh, can sustainably uh, carry on as well. And with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, it seems like there are a lot of similar themes in terms of the threats and the potential conservation measures that are coming up. And it certainly seems like a multi-layered approach is necessary. People working at the international level and uh, at regional levels and also at national levels. So now I invite Shanta to tell us a little more about what's happening uh, at the national level in her country, but also to specifically talk about uh, the, her work involving fishing communities and how uh, an approach at that uh, sort of smaller scale is actually playing out. So thank you, Shanta. And you can start your presentation. Thank you, Divya. Thank you for inviting me. And a good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me know if you can see my screen. And I will move on from here. So I will, uh, because Rima and Daniel has um, gave such informative presentation, I will start um, right on like what we have in Bangladesh and what we are doing to conserve them and how we are doing that. So first of all, I would like to say about uh, the amazing diversity of sharks and rays we have in our coastal water. And more than 100 species of sharks and rays have been um, confirmed from our waters that include um, that include uh, rare sawfish and river sharks. We have like charismatic manta rays and odd looking hammerhead sharks, uh, along with um, other marine wildlife that is uh, present in a rich diversity as well that includes dolphins, whales, and porpoises. Um, and I will say it is because of the extraordinary oceanic conditions of Bay of Bengal, which makes the coastal water a really ideal habitat for all these marine wildlife. And, but unfortunately, um, almost two thirds of these animals are threatened in our waters. You can see from the slides, like the numbers of critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable sharks and rays we have. And I would say that uh, our journey has just started. We are working on sharks and rays uh, fairly recently. And um, 
the information we are getting is is really impressive and the way we are improving our knowledge the rate um it is impressive and i would say that we are advancing pretty quickly and the way we are collecting this data uh, this includes a unique way because we think we believe that our coastal fishermen and coastal uh, fish traders they are among the most knowledgeable person or sh on sharks and rays so the wildlife conservation society marine conservation team we have engaged these people the coastal fishermen and fish trader to collect, collect data for us so the way they do it is um, it's uh, we are engaging coastal fishermen in a very unique and mutually beneficial way so we provided these fishermen with GPSs and uh, we trained them on how to use these. And in exchange, they are providing us um, their uh, catch information and also shark and ray bycatch information. And we also trained uh, community members of fishing communities. So they are um, uh, doing the landing site daily on a uh, visit on a daily basis. And we are collecting data from eight coastal landing sites. And when in the uh, winter season, when it, the ocean is calm, we ourselves venture out at sea and we collect, um, we do visual surveys and also fisheries investigation. And in that way, we collect, uh, we sample like their fishing gears for shark and ray catches. And also we do interview service. Uh, from these sources, we collect our data. And I know it's not, a lot and there are obviously major gaps because our uh, data is mostly from artisanal um, gears and we are still lacking a huge part of the industrial landing that we are having but um, we are advancing in the data collection system so uh, from last three years we have collected 8,000 net set, gill net sets and um, almost 3,000 landings of sharks and rays and we are currently analyzing them. And our plan is to use this data, like the species where this is caught in which gear and wow. when we are planning to uh, use this data to inform conservation management plans, also in general marine fisheries uh, sustainability. So as my previous um, as speaker said, like there are obviously major gaps and problems because uh, we are collecting a whole lot of sharks and rays at a rapid amount and, uh, and they're ecologically vulnerable. So in Bangladesh, our data showed that um, the highest number of landings where uh, the sharks and rays were caught in medium mesh gill nets and set bag nets, the nets that are set uh, and used tied for catching fish and a huge amount of juvenile sharks and rays get caught in that because these nets are usually non-selective. And then comes the long lines. These are the uh, main three fishing gears that are um, catching sharks and rays. Um, but um, if uh, I want to say a very interesting fact that will be um, we have actually a targeted ray fishery. If you look at the right uh, right corner, bottom right corner, the hooks that uh, they are using, these are really sharp hooks. Our fishermen of the central coastal zone, they use it unbaited, which is new uh, from our coastal knowledge. And these uh, hooks are set in a unique way. These are like suspended just above the bottom and uh, a very sharp hooks. So anything that goes by near these hooks that get, gets caught and uh, there's no way that the fish or sh the ray will be, you know, uh, get free. So this is our only targeted shark or ray fishery that we know of. But interestingly, this is, this uh, fishing gear actually um, has a very negligible almost, I, I would say, very negligible amount of shark and ray landing. So the main landing of sharks and ray in our landing size are actually bycatch. So the bycatch that is resulting in almost 47,000 of metric tons of shark fin import from uh, Bangladesh to only Hong Kong. If you look at the, the uh, graphs above, you will see the left side graph, it says like 
from 2010. After that, we don't have any national record of shark fin trade. But in, if we look at the data from Hong Kong, we, we would see like it has increased every year. So although we are saying this is bycatch, this is actually resulting in a very unsustainable fishing method. So it is high time that we stop overlooking sharks and rays as bycatch and we acknowledge their, their role in the ocean as their, for their ecological values. I would like to discuss uh, about two um, shark and ray groups that are very interesting from our data set. You know, one is the sawfish, as Divya, you say, like sawfish are really, really rare now. And we, you know, if there is a landing, it, it becomes a news. So um, we have actually uh, confirmed two species of sawfish from Bangladesh. One is um, Anapsopristis and then the large tooth sawfish. And large tooth sawfish is actually the most common. Uh, from December 2016 uh, to January 2019, we have actually recorded nine landing of uh, large tooth sawfish, which is quite a lot for a species that is that much rare. So um, our assumption is that Bangladesh still has a viable, I would say, it still has a remaining population. And if we do take steps to protect these animals, it is possible that these animals will survive in the Bay of Bengal region. I was, um, I wanted to talk about sawfish because it has a different kind of uh, market chain in Bangladesh. It is sold at a really, really high value. And the reason behind it, because the community people, they think that it cures cancer. So obviously it is, um, very valuable among them. But more interestingly, uh, we uh, have heard from uh, many formal and informal consultations that this meat are actually sometime pre-ordered from Calcutta in India. So that opens up a really, you know, different type of market chain other than shark fin because it is the shark meat, I mean, ray meat. So, yeah. So. Sawfish is um, our uh, one of our um, focal species. We are working on finding out like which is the uh, priority uh, site and habitat for this species. Where do we can find this species really? And we are also having a focused educational outreach uh, exhibition for communities to inform that you know about their conservation uh, needs and how they do not cure cancer, obviously. And then I would like to speak a little bit about the hammerhead sharks because um, in the recent IUCN global assessment, uh, most of the species are proved to be at the, like the ultimate risk of extinction. Uh, in Bangladesh, we have four different types of um, um, species among which scalloped and great hammerhead are critically endangered. But unfortunately, from our landings, we have seen that hammerheads are the second highest landing in the coastal landing sites. That is, of course, worrisome. Uh, we have seen um, different life stages of the species in our coastal um, landing sites, from pups to gravid females. That also indicate that this is the coastal water of Bangladesh is maybe a preferred or suitable habitat for this species. Also, the shallower water, they are using it as a nursery ground. So we are collecting, uh, I mean, we are using our georeference data from uh, previous I told about you about. We are using that data to identify habitat suitability models so that we know uh, where these species can be found and we can inform science-based in, uh, management requirement for this species. So what we are doing to protect these animals, um, the government of Bangladesh is um, really concerned about uh, protecting these straightened sharks and rays. Um, we, um, uh, our forest department has co-sponsored um, to improve the trade re regulation of the species and co-sponsored many sharks. Um, in the last COP, we have co-sponsored guitar fish and wedge fish and macro shark in the CITES convention. We're also uh, working uh, 
to improve the uh, special protection. So two marine protected areas have been declared till now, and uh, one is under the consideration of being declared. We're also uh, working on advancing our um, technological support. Uh, we are using smart technology to prevent illegal fishing and um, that, that can be reported and we can you know, definitely ensure man proper management. But we also believe that um, no law can ensure you know, ultimate protection as long as the community or the people who are engaged in these um, fisheries are not aware. So our next step is to work directly with community. We are, uh, we are doing community exhibitions at the coastal, uh, coastal areas. Our um, traveling exhibition that includes uh, life-size models. Uh, we have informative panels so that the community can see and learn about what is happening and why they're threatened. Um, recently, we have launched a radio program. That radio program is um, was collab in collaboration with six um, radio stations. They have uh, reached almost a million of listeners, and they told we have engaged like uh, government officials who talked about the rules regarding threatened sharks and rays. We have included doctors who um, debunked them. Uh, the, the local meats of uh, medicinal values. We have uh, included marine biologists who talked about the ecology of sharks and rays. And so um, that's what we are doing in the community. And I would like to say that also, although there are so many you know, major gaps, as I said before, but um, things are improving. And I would like to end with the line that I often say to the children of fishing villages that these animals are here before the dinosaurs and we cannot just let them disappear right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shanta. I can see uh, so many parallels between the kinds of things that you are saying and uh, what we face in India. And I'm sure uh, what we face in this region as a whole with respect to the non-selective fishing gear being one of the major issues and it's not so much uh, selective fishing and so on. But uh, right now we are being flooded with questions both on Zoom as well as on YouTube where this uh, panel is being streamed live. And so I think without any further delay, we'll just get into the questions. Um, I think one of the first questions that people were wondering about is uh, what, why do we need to protect sharks or rays or any of these species in the first place? I mean, they understand that these species are in decline, but what is their role in the marine environment? And uh, why are we so concerned about them declining in the first place? Uh, I think if Shanta, you want to go ahead since you were the last speaker and then we can hear from the others. Sure, I'm sorry, it's really hot in here. So I was fighting, so. Um, the reason behind why we need to conserve these animals because um, think about a tiger. What, what's the role of a tiger in the forest? It keeps the environment in a harmony so that there is not much of a deer and you know the natural food chain is not breaking. So being the top predator in the environment, sharks and rays are doing the same. So if we do not conserve sharks and rays in their own environment, the environment will collapse. And uh, um, I know that we are relying much on, you know, the fisheries and marine fisheries for our for the growth of our national economy. But if there is no sharks and rays, there will be no fish. So ultimately, it will hamper everything that is there. So that's why we need to conserve sharks and rays. Does anyone want to add? Um, I have a different version of this. <laughs> um, we, 
I, I would like to, to give you scientific evidence that says that if we remove sharks and rays from the marine environment as top predators, the food chain would collapse. We don't have that kind of evidence. It's speculation on our part because it makes sense. And, and the reality is, is if you had a human pyramid, okay? So people standing on top of each other, no matter how strong your pyramid is, even if it's human or if it's animal, once one component becomes loose or fails, then it gets really shaky before it quickly tumbles. And that's what we are seeing. And there's, um, there's so much that's happening around the world and it's very difficult to pinpoint what is causing changes to the marine environment. But um, we do know that something is happening and these are extremely important animals from an evolutionary perspective. Some of them are millions and millions of years old. And if we're taking them out, then we are having an impact on the marine environment. Daniel, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, no, I think that pretty much uh, covered it. I mean, at the end of the day, we want a healthy uh, marine environment with high species diversity. Uh, and, you know, I mean, these are also species that benefit fishers across the world. So we need to be uh, considering the economic incentives as well. Uh, I mean, not just economic, but also the fact that there are fishers who probably rely on these species from a subsistence perspective. So, yeah, they have multiple roles to play. Great. Thank you. Um, our next set of questions, uh, there was one by Dilini from Sri Lanka and uh, also others from India and so on, involved uh, asking how people can be involved in shark conservation and uh, also how a student or a you know amateur researcher could get into the field and maybe you could also share some stories of how you got into the field um, but yeah i just wanted to say that since there's no india representation here right now um, if you are interested in working in india please do get in touch but otherwise uh, if you are interested in working in other parts of this region, I think uh, the panelists would be better placed to tell you about that. So why don't we hear from Daniel first and then go to the others? Yeah, so to address the first, uh, well, the second part of your question, which is, you know, how, how you can get involved yourself directly. And I mean, like Divya mentioned, uh, you know, reach out to people. There are many organizations who are already doing work and what they are lacking quite often is uh, sufficient personnel. So people interested who can spend time to go out into the field and collect data. What one has to realize is that this is not something one can just do over a weekend or over one or two weeks. If you're truly passionate to learn about these species and get involved, you have to commit some serious time. Uh, for example, with the work that we do, it takes about a month to train somebody up to get them used to collecting data and identifying some of these species. So it is quite a big uh, investment, but you know, marine biology and, and studying species like sharks and rays is something that you have to be passionate about because if you are, you will find your path and you, know, you will always find people who are happy to work with you, happy to help, happy to guide you along the path. Uh, so do reach out and, and just send emails and speak to organizations whenever you can. And to address the first part of your question where you ask what the general public can do, well, it goes to some extent to what we all consume. You know, try and make a conscious decision with what you're purchasing. Uh, you know, something even as simple as, you know, when you go to a restaurant and they have seafood on the menu, ask them where it was caught from and how it was caught. I can tell you right now, they won't know the answer, but asking these questions will start pushing restaurants and people to start thinking more about this. And the more that they think about it, uh, you know, the further along the line this message gets passed. So, you know, that goes hand in hand with, of course, raising awareness and spreading the message about the issues that these species are facing. But, at the end of the day, we also have to work from a higher level, work with policy 
uh, officials, work with governments. And as an individual, we can always, you know, write letters to the government, ask them what they're doing about these species. And when we have big decisions, like, you know, we had elections in Sri Lanka just last week, uh, try and find out what uh, the candidates are thinking about from a marine perspective. Do they, do they have an environment, do they have an opinion on environment in general? Do they know that a marine world exists? And yeah, just ask as many questions as possible and try and make as many conscious decisions as you can when it comes to seeking. Shanta, do you want to add? Yeah, I would like to say as, uh, I mean, Daniel said most of it, but in Bangladesh, I know that if uh, you want to work because WCS is uh, engaging citizen scientists, al although they're mostly from fishing community, but if you are really interested, you know, if, uh, with proper training, someone, if someone wants, we can engage them as citizen scientists. And uh, of course, as Daniel said, make, uh, you know, conscious decisions about seafood and in general, you know, for about ocean uh, animals. Yeah, that, that's it. Bima? Um, I agree with uh, the first part with Daniel that each of us can make a difference. It's uh, baby steps but you start with small things and um, you'd be surprised at how much it sparks conversations and how much it actually leads to change. So I encourage all of you to talk about issues that you're interested in with your family, with your friends, and it will lead uh, to change eventually. I've seen it all around me and um, it's always really nice to see how much one conversation on sharks and rays can lead to so many changes. Uh, from the second part, I started off not working on sharks and rays. I'm, I have a background in political science. I was just interested in this field and I started volunteering. And I am where I am today because of all the wonderful people that I've met along the way that have motivated me, that have supported me and that have given me advice. And you need to reach out to people to see who is going to, to help you, to mentor you. But you also need to be serious about what you're doing. Um, you cannot, uh, people are going to invest time in you and they're going to, to guide you and they're going to help you, but you also need to commit yourself to what you're doing. And this is how you'll get something out of it. So like Daniel said, it's not about coming in for one day and saying you wanna work on shark conservation. There are, there are organizations that will allow you to do that. And if it's just that experience you want, then it, you should contact them. But if you're serious about it, you need to, to think that you should commit time and that you will get the right support uh, if you're willing to commit that time. Okay. Uh, we also have a bunch of questions with respect to the involvement of fishing communities. Uh, I think uh, maybe Shanta can start with this one, but uh, Sridhar, for example, uh, from YouTube said that these kind of wildlife conservation policies uh, that are intended to conserve sharks can often be seen as harassment towards fishing communities because uh, there's always this conflict between what fishers want to do and perhaps the protection of sharks, particularly with respect to bycatch fisheries. So uh, his question was, how, how do we overcome those kinds of issues? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I understand what he's saying because um, honestly, we have seen such kind of problems in our country. So because these are bycatch and our policies are not well um, formulated still now on sharks and rays, we were having this kind of problem. So what we are doing is to inform both stakeholders that includes community uh, people so that they know what are protected actually and they know like what is the rule if um, they accidentally catch uh, a protected animal and we are also working with uh, policymakers so that they do not harass someone or fishermen for catching what is you know what is not protected under the law so this will uh, come with uh, you know, proper knowledge of your policies. So as, as conservationist, as 
you know, a person who is working on this, I I can you know inform them and that we are doing. Yeah. Okay, so building on this idea of um, needing to create awareness, both with the fishing communities and also with the general public, uh, I think some people were wondering how you do that, because most people just see the fish after it's dead. So how do you really connect with an animal when you can't, you know, be in its ecosystem and see its beauty while it's alive, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera? So how do you overcome those, uh, I think, basic issues with not being able to be underwater and see things? That's a good question. So um, uh, what we are doing in uh, our, from our program is that, as I mentioned, uh, in our traveling exhibitions, we have life-size models and we do have panels that has the information about this. So if they want to know like how does it look and they don't have to go underwater and you know we don't want any dead animals so we are um, informing people and also there are so many tools like uh, for informing uh, look-alike animals and so that they know like which one species is protected so i i will say there are tools uh, for using to inform what species are protected. And we are also developing those tools for easy communication. Yeah. And I think there are some limitations uh, to a place like Bangladesh, where the water is not uh, the most clear for things like diving tourism or whatever. But I think the case may be different in Sri Lanka. Uh, what do you think, Daniel, about awareness of fishers and general awareness? So, yeah, I mean, one of the big challenges is awareness for fishers, you know, not just of the regulations, but like uh, discussed about the, you know, the general charisma and the beauty of these species and, uh, you know, to maybe potentially get a bit more empathy from the fishers for these species. Um, but I mean, you know, we're living in a in a world with a lot of technology where you know you have all these amazing documentaries on the underwater world and all that and i think what we are really lacking on and what we should capitalize on is taking these documentaries and translating them into the local languages because quite often it's the language barrier that is existing in uh, in getting this information to the ground level so i think that is something that should uh, certainly be looked at to you know, in general, increase awareness of these species for the general public and for local communities. Um, sorry, what was the second part of the question again? Uh, awareness for the general public, I think, that's it. Okay, yeah, but I good. think uh, another thing was that there's so much focus on uh, fishers themselves and trying to involve them in conservation and capacity building, etc. But uh, some of the larger players in this seem to be the traders. So what is being done with respect to working with them? Well, I think with the, the traders, it's actually a lot easier because they're generally quite well informed, at least in Sri Lanka, because the traders are you know, working quite closely with customs and with the fisheries department to get all the necessary permissions to export the products or the species. So at that point in time, you know, they are quite well informed about the regulations and the measures that have to be followed. And, you know, quite often they are very happy to be compliant and all that, uh, you know, with the existing management measures. But sometimes the practical challenges come into play. So, you know, with the identification, for example, with uh, shark fins and all that, there are plenty of visual identification tools available. Uh, but it's challenging when it comes to other products like shark meat or shark oil that is being uh, exported and imported. So those are some of the challenges that we still have to overcome uh, when we are dealing specifically with the traders. Okay. Um, Rima, I think there have been a couple of questions that are addressed directly to you. So Yashendu Joshi says uh, he's read literature on the Bay of Bengal large marine ecosystem and their approach for ecosystem-based management and conservation and so on. 
uh, but how come there's not much literature available at least on uh, the Northwestern Indian Ocean or the Arabian Sea large marine ecosystem? It's specific to sharks and rays or just as an LME in general? Um, Okay. Well, I guess I, 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 I just, anyway, <laughs> there has been, from from a large marine ecosystem area, the the whole Arabian Seas region is understudied, and that's partly why there's so little information about it. I think the Bay of Bengal has received a lot more um, support from other countries, from other entities, particularly the Food and Agriculture Organization, for example, for a lot of the surveys that have been done there to document biodiversity. A lot less has been available for the Arabian Seas region, partly because a lot of the countries that are here are a lot more developed and cannot receive the same type of foreign aid. Uh, and yet their interest is not necessarily uh, gathering or doing research on uh, on marine uh, on marine species, specifically sharks and rays. So there's a lot less information. But I think that's been addressed largely, at least for this this particular group, by smaller organizations that are working in the region or independent projects in the region trying to collect the data that's necessary to be able to understand what's happening to these species. Mm. And uh, Unayan, who has worked in Gujarat as a volunteer on a project, has said that uh, when speaking to fishers, he noticed that a lot of them had noticed the disappearance of large bodied sharks, but they keep catching small bodied sharks. So what is going to be the result of that? Uh, are sharks just going to start getting smaller or are they just going to disappear? What is going to happen? So this is interesting because we've been using actually fisher knowledge increasingly to understand what's been happening in the past and it's called fishers ecological knowledge and what it's showing us is that um, what they were seeing 20 30 years ago has changed a lot and what they've basically all seen is that these large sharks have disappeared and it's called growth overfishing so we've removed all the big animals and we're gonna start seeing a lot less of these species until they disappear because unless we get, we leave them to grow to a size where they are mature and they can reproduce, that species will no longer be viable. So we're gonna start losing species and the smaller, more reproductive species will be the ones that will take over some of the markets. And you will have seen this already in Gujarat with um, the Scoliodon laticaudus, uh, the, um, Oh, I'm terrible with common names, sorry. Uh, spade nose. Thank you. The spade nose shark, <laughs> the spade nose shark or the, the milk shark will have overtaken uh, some of the, um, the markets in terms of uh, quantities. And we're seeing this across a lot of countries where um, 10, 15 years ago, we used to go to a fish market and we used to see 20 different species all in equal quantities with a lot of large sharks. We're noticing now that in areas that are overfished, we're seeing maybe five, six, seven species that dominate these landings and they're all small sharks that are able to reproduce very quickly. So it's, um, for me, it's a scary sign because it means that we're, we're gonna be losing whatever is left of those large sharks very, very quickly and something needs to be done. Um, and uh, there was also some questions about uh, gan gangetic sharks and I think Rima it would be interesting for you to talk about the gangetic shark uh, paper that you have because uh, the questions were largely oriented towards what the status is uh, in Bangladesh because that's where they're assumed to be most but uh, I think it you can start by talking about your work and then we'll move over to Shanta. Well, it was really our work, Divya, um, <laughs> that you were involved in that project. But it, was, it wasn't actually me that found the shark. It was um, one of the, the volunteers on the project, Evan Nazareth, and he was doing routine monitoring at Sassoon Dock in, in uh, Bombay and came across the shark that he hadn't seen before and took a few pictures of it. And once we started looking at it, we realized that it was actually um, a Ganges shark, which had not been seen in, in decades in, uh, in this area. Um, it has been seen more frequently in Bangladesh, so there are definitely more sightings of it. 
there's still some taxonomic confusion as to what species is actually occurring in these waters. So um, we think it's a Ganges shark, but there needs to be a little more uh, work that's done on the taxonomy. Now, there are sharks that we think are very rare initially, which makes them more prone to uh, overexploitation if they're fished out. Uh, Bangladesh might be one of those strongholds that's still there. And so it's, it would be really important to try and understand where these fishermen are catching them, if there's a specific area and, and uh, what's really happening there. Because uh, if it is one of the strongholds for these really rare animals, it would be very important to protect that area and try and conserve these species. Yeah, and Shanta, just before I come over to you, I think um, talking about strongholds for species, it's like you were saying, it's a stronghold also for the sawfish. And I think if you could address how these two really rare and really important species uh, are being conserved and what you can do and what you are doing, uh, I think that would be great. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned earlier that uh, sawfish and uh, Ganges shark both are really, really rare, but um, sawfish we still see, unfortunately, after they are dead. So we are uh, right now trying to uh, find out what is actually the most suitable area for these animals. So as uh, Rima said, like we are trying to use fishes knowledge, um, like in the Eastern part, most of the fishermen said like they have never seen a sawfish before and this is the first time when we show the picture they said this is the first time they are seeing it and they have heard from their fathers or grandfathers that there were a fish like that but in the southwestern part they are mostly saying yes we have seen it like 15 years ago so we are assuming that this this area like adjacent to uh, Shundabans, this is mainly a priority habitat this could be so we are trying to uh, strengthen our this knowledge and um, you know we are trying to develop habitat suitability model and so that we know like exactly where we should focus on to improve our conservation efforts for conserving sawfish because we honestly believe that if we can protect sawfish in this area there will be sawfish you know at least remaining in the Bay of Bengal. And it's same for the Ganges shark because it is so rare and we have just came across only two or three records. This is like, we are still understanding what's happening. There was a recent genetic study which uh, proved that it was indeed a, a Ganges shark. It was done by Ali Fahok. She is, you know, doing genetic work. So we are, uh, planning to collaborate and we are also planning to work with fishers so that we can do the same for Ganges shark as well. So we have just started our work on both of these animals and we are hoping that it will be advanced pretty soon. Great. Um, so unfortunately it looks like we are reaching close to the end so I'll have to quickly condense uh, a lot of uh, people's questions into one sort of overarching question. So there are people like Ima and Deepya and a bunch of other people who picked up on the fact that most of the fisheries in this region that seem to threaten sharks are uh, non-selective. And so we are talking about uh, trying to conserve particular species even though they are being caught in non-selective gears. So what can be done at international or national or regional levels uh, to deal with this? Uh, Daniel, since you work a lot at international levels, maybe you can start with that and then we can go to others. Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, at an international level, we are of course working through conventions that uh, deal primarily with the trade of uh, species. So that, can have an impact, but that relies a lot more on it getting translated down onto the ground. And I think, you know, as pointed out by uh, many of the uh, participants here, the biggest issue that we are facing is that these are bycatch. So we have to sometimes look at different ways at managing this. Uh, simply adding a species to a protected list and ensuring that they get released may not be the solution for all the species. It is definitely required for some of the most endangered and threatened species, 
uh, because it gives them some uh, chance of survival. But we also have to carry out a lot more research to identify what proportion are actually surviving once you release them. But I think alternative methods, uh, for example, simply limiting the number of vessels. Uh, in Sri Lanka, we already have over 50,000 fishing vessels. And unfortunately, there is no cap on the number of vessels. So theoretically, I could go today and register another 1,000 vessels, and it's not an issue. So we should be looking at capping the number of vessels across the region. We should be looking at uh, marine protected areas. So these have proven to be successful for uh, sharks and rays. Uh, not just small areas, but also larger areas, and ideally looking at uh, transboundary MPS. That's something that hasn't been done much, but I think, you know, with the habitats that we are looking at across our region, there are many opportunities. I mean, just between Sri Lanka and India, uh, between India and Bangladesh, there are all these critical habitats that are right on the border. And then another method could simply be looking at, for example, uh, time closures. And I know that both India and Bangladesh have uh, some sort of time closures in place during the monsoon season where in certain states, fishes are not allowed to go out. I think that is a good mechanism. It of course requires a bit of modification and improved implementation, but I think that is uh, an opportunity that countries across the region should be looking at in further detail. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, Rima, any closing remarks on this issue? Um, I agree with everything that Daniel has said. I think those are all really good measures in terms of uh, bycatch mitigation in a way, indirectly. But there are also direct ways. India is one of the largest, if not the largest shrimp exporter in the world. You have the largest trawling fleet in the world. There are market mechanisms that can be put in place. Countries like the US have banned import of shrimps from certain countries in West Africa if they cannot confirm or prove that they're using excluder devices, so bycatch excluder devices on their trawl vessels. And if there are, there are studies that have shown that there's actually benefits of putting these excluder devices on trawlers in terms of higher catches for the fishermen and redu reduction of bycatch. And I think if you start working with the industry to try and say, well, you're going to get more people that are going to be importing your shrimps, you're going to get less uh, animals that you actually don't need or want on your vessels and more um, better quality shrimp, that in itself can be an incentive for fishermen, to, to, for fishermen and vessel owners to start working on improving what they're doing when they're using these trawlers. And these are just some of the ways to do it. There are, for every single gear, there are bycatch mitigation measures that can be put in place that would reduce bycatch of sharks and rays. It's gonna be very context specific because not all fishermen are setting their gill nets in the same way, are using the same hooks for their long lines. So it's, you need to understand fisheries in each country. You need to understand how fishermen are operating and how you can work with them to limit the impact on their livelihoods while increasing the impact, I guess, on, on sharks and rays in terms of releasing them back alive and uh, making sure that they're not uh, discarded dead. So there, there's, there's a big, bycatch is a big conversation, but there is definitely, there are a lot of tools and measures out there that have been proven successful around the world. Uh, Shanta, yeah, just before I come to you, I just uh, want to say that uh, we're almost out of time. So if you just have a some short concluding remarks, then uh, maybe you can add to this conversation from the Bangladesh perspective. Yeah, I would definitely agree with both uh, Rima and Daniel. And I would say there's no simple way, but we will have to be heard sometimes because we cannot simply allow, you know, in Bangladesh, targeted shark or ray fishery, we cannot simply allow any setback net that catches all the juvenile shark, you know, not just sharks and rays, all kind of uh, fish. So we'll have to definitely ban those type of gears. And we know that, you know, uh, community livelihood is a very big concern because we are a very poor, you know, region. So uh, we will have to find a ways that balances these two things, uh, community livelihood, as well as the conservation impact in Bangladesh. We are trying to develop Marine special planning so that we can ensure that conservation and livelihood are going simultaneously. 
So I think this is a good approach and this can be surely done. Thanks. Thank you. So here I'd like to stop. Thank you to all the panelists uh, for attending and all the participants, especially for all the questions. I'm so sorry that we ran out of time and we couldn't uh, ask all the questions that you guys asked, but certainly feel free to reach out to all the panelists and uh, ask them these questions and so on in the future. Um, thank you definitely to the teams involved. I think we've heard a lot about how uh, you can't speak about shark conservation in isolation, that it's something that needs to be part of a larger conversation about livelihoods and justice and fisheries. Uh, and this is something that we should definitely take away from this conversation that you may want to work on sharks, but you'll have to keep yourself open to all these other things if you do. So uh, at this stage, I'd just like to thank everyone and uh, see you hopefully next time if there is a, another edition of something like this. Thank you. Thank you, Divya, and thanks everyone for participating. Thanks, Divya. Thank you, everybody.